Well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. And uh, we're going to continue our studies. We had a nice presentation from Dwight um, on Zechariah uh, chapter 5 and chapter 4. And now we're going to look at the symbolic use of numbers in God's word and the history of it in our movement and, and a lot of it, the history of it in my, my personal experience. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> uh, dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here. We are thankful for the Sabbath in which we can receive special blessings, blessings of your presence, of your promises to us, of your peace, even in this world of sin and suffering, and even in the midst of trial, that we can have a comfort in you that the world cannot have. And we are thankful for the Lord, Lord for the way that you have led us uh, through the years, each of us in our lives, our personal experience, and how you have come to us and shown us our need of you and how we have responded. And we ask, Lord, that we can continue to respond. And I pray that as we look at the symbolic use of numbers, that we can see your hand in our lives and in this movement and that we can trust that you are going to continue to lead us to a greater knowledge of you and of ourselves, of our sins, and that you will provide power uh, to accomplish the work that you've asked us to do. Forgive us for our sins and be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, Last week and the week before, we started this study on symbolic use of numbers. Now, uh, what we have been doing is going through uh, just what numbers mean, Palmo and I, uh, how we have these different prophetic periods. And, and what I'm trying to do in this study uh, is to go through uh, my personal history and, and I have a paper which I've written, which I have to revise, but I haven't done so yet. And uh, so this is just stuff from. So we, we looked a little bit at um, the prophetic mirror. We looked a little bit at the 70 weeks. And, and these, of course, the 2520, we looked at that. And so I'm just going to kind of review this a little bit. So in 2011, I came to understand the 2604 year prophetic mirror and it says four that should be from yeah typos from 742 bc to 1863 our understanding developed from the two 2520s one for israel i don't know why it keeps popping up um <clears throat> uh one for uh, just ignore that i guess <clears throat> Um, one for Israel from 723 to 1798, and the other for Judah from 677 to 1844. First, we used Millerite understanding of Isaiah 7, verse 8 to 9, in giving us the starting dates that occur within the 65-year prophecy. So, you know, and I've talked about that a little bit, and we're, we're going to look at this a lot more as, as we go on. But these symbols start to come from these prophecies. And last time we looked at this chart that I had done in 2014, where I started looking at all the different prophetic periods and the proportions of these periods and how they fit together. Now, one of the problems that I ran into, so when I began looking at the 2520s, that's what I want to look at today, um, we needed to find these dates. So we needed to find 742 B.C., and the 65-year prophecy ending in 677. And we need to establish that that date, those dates are correct. So that Manasseh was taken captive in 677. And we also needed to understand 723 BC, because that's going to give us the 19 years. So we know that this is going to give us these periods of time at the end as well. Part of the problem had to do with chronology. So... Even though as a Seventh-day Adventist, we all have some idea that there is prophetic periods that have have to be established um, 
as dates in history, right? So, for instance, you can never study the 2300 days without understanding chronology, right? You would have to say, well, where are we going to start the 2300 days? You know, what's the event? Can we date that event? Uh, because if it's going to end in 1844, it's going to have to start in 457 BC. So most Seventh-day Adventists who have any interest in prophecy are going to know that we need an understanding of chronology. We also need to know when, when was Jesus crucified, uh, because that would be important for the 70 weeks. When was Stephen stoned? You know, what events are being marked in the 70th week, the baptism of Christ? How would we date these things? <clears throat> but a big problem we had is that an Adventist theologian and scholar, Edwin Field, he was actually uh, studied at the Assyrian school in Chicago, the University of Chicago. And so he was an Assyriologist and, and a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, one of the Adventists who was following the guidelines of the 1919 Bible conference, the effects of that, of the idea of having our ministers getting degrees in non-Adventist universities. And so he's going to go to the <clears throat> University of Chicago at the Assyrian School and become an Assyriologist. And he's going to write a book called um, uh, The Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings or something like that. I think that's the title. Now, what he does from the chronology that we had with Usher or, or the correct, correct chronology, he removes 45 years from the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel. And that is the chronology that you will see when you go to Wikipedia. They'll show you Albright and they'll show you Thiel because they have some differences, but they're basically the same idea. And this was his imagined co-regencies that he had in the Bible. That is, he's not going to take the how long a king reigned as how long he reigned uh, by himself. He's going to say that, that part of that reign is a part of his father's reign and that there's all of these co-regencies in Scripture. And as far as I can see, there's only one co-regency. That's going to be uh, Jehoshaphat and uh, Jehoram, I believe. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, he has these imagined co-regencies. And what he's trying to do is create an alignment between biblical and Assyrian synchronisms. That is, he's making some assumptions about Assyrian history and different documents and trying to date those, align those with biblical dates. And I'm not going to go into the detail of that right now, but... Um, these assumptions have been shown to be faulty. Many people have shown where where he makes his mistakes. And and also it creates uh, all kinds of problems with the biblical account on the ages of of the different kings they were and their sons. Because you got I can't remember which one it is, but one of them would be two years old when he had his son. Um, so obviously people have tried to correct that. And, and sometimes what they do is they just say, well, there's a typo. Right. So the Bible is full of all kinds of typos with numbers, supposedly, um, that because they don't fit in with our understanding, then we just say, well, you know, the Bible must be wrong. Um, now, he, he places Manasseh's reign 10 years later than the Bible. So he makes 677 B.C. Manasseh's 10th year. Right. So that that's going to be a problem. Um, and, and more destructively, he moves Ahaz and Hezekiah's reigns later as well. In fact, Theo rejects the synchronisms of 2 Kings 17 and 18 that place the fall of Samaria in the sixth year of Hezekiah's reign. He has Ahaz's reign starting in 732, so the 65-year prophecy wouldn't fit. And Hezekiah's beginning 10 years, his reign begins 10 years after the fall of Samaria, even though the Bible plainly tells us and the spirit of prophecy plainly tells us uh, that Hezekiah is the king um, in the time of Hoshea, where he's saying no, they're not contemporary kings at all. And then we're also going to have the problem with Second Chronicles 29 and 30, where it talks about this invitation that goes out to northern Israel in the first year of Hezekiah. That's going to happen before the fall of Samaria. 
And Ellen White clarifies that as well. So Edwin Thiel is, is rejecting scripture. Now, one of the things about it is when we were looking at um, understanding the 2520 for Israel, beginning in the fall of, or, or beginning with the fall of Samaria in 723 BC, Thiel actually gives this date for the fall of Samaria. So he's going to have Samaria fall in 723 and Hezekiah, his, his reign is going to start in seven or not Hezekiah. Ahaz's reign is going to be in 732 and Hezekiah's reign is going to start in 713 BC. But yeah, 723, 732. No, that's 732 is correct. Ahaz's reign here. He has Ahaz beginning his reign in 732 instead of 723, or instead of 742, pardon me, (laughs) right? So we have Ahaz, his first year of his reign, that's Isaiah chapter 7, the 65-year prophecy starts in 742, but Thiel is not going to have Ahaz's reign begin until 732, 10 years later, and Hezekiah's reign begin in 713 uh, B.C., 10 years after the fall of Samaria, which he places in 723. Now, Samaria actually falls in 721. So uh, she might be talking about later on in the uh, paragraph near the bottom of the screen. Oh, down here? Yeah. Okay, I haven't got there yet. So there's my typo. Yeah, I was trying to see ahead if she was talking about that. Okay. Anyway, that hopefully that clarifies these problems. Now, so when we we started looking at uh, then, and it, it took me a while actually to understand that actually that the twenty five twenty for northern Israel does not begin with the fall of Samaria, because that's going to happen two years after Hoshea is taken captive. It's actually his captivity that, that marks the beginning of the twenty five twenty. That is when the land is forsaken of both their kings in Isaiah chapter 7. So you got 19 years till Hoshea is taken captive from 742. And then um, another 46 years later, and then Manasseh is taken captive. So we, we, we all are familiar with the prophetic mirror. Now, this was something that for me personally, I had to do, right? If I was going to accept the 2520, uh, one is I had to be sure that it was established on reality that it wasn't a faulty chronology. Now, the problem with chronology is it's a very difficult topic. And and what most people do is they will just look up a date, they find somebody says something happens on some date, and then that must be the correct date. And and then they will have some other date, like you'll see this with writers all the time, they will quote, you know, that something happened on such and such a date, and then they will have someplace else in their book or whatever, something else happened on another date. And actually, those two dates are incompatible because one comes from a whole set of assumptions that are different than the other date that they have quoted. It comes from another set of assumptions, right? So it took me a couple of years of full-time study. So I'm saying probably about 50 hours a week um, for a few years uh, to get just the kings of, of Judah and Israel sort of straight in my head that I could get the basic understanding of uh, 1097 for uh, Saul being anointed and and going all the way to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586. So so I'd had established that by 2014. But I had really started studying this problem in 2011. So it's quite a period of time. So you're looking at it roughly well about two and a half years. And and mostly it was that time was spent just studying that chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel. I mean, it's obviously I was looking at other things, but most of my time was spent doing that. Now, do people have questions about this? I mean, are we all familiar with with these details? And and the one detail that we have, you know, um, that has always been attacked is the captivity of Manasseh, right? So if we have, um, and I'm going to show it to you here, but, uh, but there is this document, um, and I'm just going to show it to you here from uh, 
a, a website that I use, Livius. So when I started sharing the prophetic mirror, there was a, a number of people who uh, on Facebook were really trying to uh, destroy the 2520. And, and they were trying to do this. Um, and you're going to see this guy has some different dates than, than what I have, but uh, there's, there's always differences of opinion about things. Now, SR Hayden, SR Hayden, he's going to be the Assyrian king and he's going to have a, um, a prism made of, that's not the prism there, of, of some of the, his events that he was involved in. And, uh, so he's going to reign from 680 to 669. So that's 11 years. Some people give, uh, 681. So it just depends exactly where you place it. And this is a translation of the prism B. And you'll see how this is translated is kind of, um, uh, based on, on how they interpret this document. So we know Manasseh was, uh, taken captive in, um, you know, he was taken captive in, it mentions it in second Chronicles 33 verse 11. And that's on, uh, the 1843 chart right at the top, right? It's the captivity of Manasseh. That's going to begin, uh, the 1843 and the 1850 chart, 677 BC. And now that understanding of when this happened. So when the Millerites had chosen that date, they did not have prism B, right? They, they didn't have a record uh, outside of the Bible of Manasseh's captivity. And determining that date of when Manasseh was taken captive was based primarily on some Jewish sources. Now, they knew it was under the time of, of um, S.R. Hayden, that is, other people did, but the, but the Jews had placed it in the 22nd year of Manasseh's reign. So that was the opinion of the Jews. Now, we know some people want to put Manasseh's reign later, or Manasseh's captivity later in his reign. Uh, but Ellen White's quite clear that the captivity of Manasseh happens when Babylon is the temporary capital of Assyria. And that only happens in S.R. Hayden's reign. It doesn't happen any other time. And um, and this is the, the document here, so let's zoom in a little bit more. I called up the kings of the country Hatti and of the region on the other side of the river Euphrates. So uh, the country Hatti is just the, that's the Levant, that's that place where, uh, you know, Syria and Israel is, right? They're on the other side of the river Euphrates. And these are the people that he called up. Baal, king of Tyre, Manasseh, king of Judah, Kawaskabar, king of Edom, Masuri, king of Moab, Silbel, king of Gaza, Mentineiti, king of Ascalon, Akasua, king of Ekron, um, etc. So a bunch of hard to pronounce names, right? Twelve kings from the seacoast. And then he mentions the twelve kings from the seacoast. Ten kings from Cyprus amidst the sea, together twenty-two kings of Hatti, the seashore, and the islands. All these I sent out and made them transport under diff terrible difficulties to Nineveh, the town of my rulership. So Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. As building material for my palace, big logs, log long beams, and thin boards, boards from cedar and pine trees products of the Sarara and Lebanon mountains, which had grown for a long time into tall and strong timber. Also from the quarries in the mountains, statue, statues of Lamassu and Shedu, protective deities made of Asnan stone, statues of Abzaztu, threshold slabs of limestone, etc. things, all these different things, etc. Now, the one thing that we see in here is we have this phrase called out. So if I said, I called up the kings of the country of Hatti and, you know, the sea coasts and, and et cetera, what would we think of the word called up? Because Matt Manasseh is taken captive in second Chronicles 3311, right? So we're going to have these, uh, in second Chronicles 3311, the way that it words it, 
is it says, wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. So the first thing that we see here is Esarhaddon, who has rebuilt the city of Babylon. It says he called up the kings of the country, right? These different people. Now, if we said somebody was called up, you know, it's like uh, he just sent some messengers. Uh, can you guys do this for me? And and the idea that many of the the commentators on this say, well, all he's doing is he's asking for money to get this stuff done. But the word um, in Assyrian that's translated as called up is the word adkima. That is A-D-K-E-M-A, adkima. And if you look it up in all of the Assyrian writings, it's the gathering of building materials, the gathering of armies, or just in general, the gather, gathering of people. And so it would actually, instead of being trans, translated called up, the best translation would be mustered, right? That is, he gathered them together. So all of these kings were brought to one place. Does that make sense? The kings themselves were brought. So, so if this is not Manasseh's captivity in Second Chronicles 33.11, and, and that captivity is referring to something much later in his reign. That means he was actually brought to Assyria, and the Bible mentions nothing about it. That is, he was taken captive twice, right? Because these kings are being taken captive. They're not just being called up to a party or being asked to do something with their money, right? Because he says... Esther Hayden says, together, 22 kings of Hattie, the seashore and the islands. All these I sent out and made them transport under terrible or difficult conditions. Right. So these terrible difficulties. So he's going to send them out and he's going to have them haul this to Nineveh. All of these logs, right, cedar and pine trees and all of these, this, this stone. So if he sends them out, where has he sent them out from and where where are they hauling this stuff to? So it tells us where they're hauling it to. They're hauling it to Nineveh. So is he sending them out from Nineveh to get them to Trent? That is, did he bring them to Nineveh or did he bring them to some other place first and then sent them out to work as slaves for him? How would you read this? Does it say that he sent them out, these kings, to do this transportation? Because it says in Second Chronicles 33, 12, and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. So if he's hauling timber under terrible difficulties, is he in affliction? He certainly is. Yes. yes, I would agree. So, so this would describe exactly what we see in Second Chronicles 33, 11 and 12. And yet this is missed by almost everyone. Now, A.T. Jones writes about this. He says, many people never believe that Manasseh was taken captive to Babylon by the king of Assyria until this document was found. And so when this document was found, then people said, oh, so what it says in the Bible is correct. So, so I found this very, very interesting. Now, this, this quote was actually first brought to me by people who were opponents of the 2520. And their argument was, this is in the year 677 that Manasseh is carried or, or goes to Assyria, to Nineveh, right? It says, it only says that he goes to Nineveh. And so he couldn't be in Babylon if he's in Nineveh in 677. So they know that this document should be dated 677. And they make an argument that since it only mentions Nineveh and doesn't mention Babylon, that Manasseh was only in Nineveh and couldn't have been in Babylon. That's their main argument against 677 is this document. 
And you can see how that doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. Right? Agreed. So so I found that interesting. And and so then I was aware of this document. And that was really early on when I started studying um, the 2520, that this document uh, came to my attention. Um, before that, I would just, you know, look up the date 677. And that's the date everybody always gave. But, you know, I hadn't had it challenged. And they challenged it with this. And so then I started looking up the history of this document and when people date it. Some people date it as 678. Some people date it as 673, depending on different assumptions that they use. Um, so, you know, there's doesn't have a date on it, per se. But we do know that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, by 677, had completed uh, the rebuilding of the city of Babylon that his father had destroyed. And, and his father had given it, this to him as sort of a, a present. So, so he had this attachment to the city of Babylon. And he rebuilt it after he had his dad murdered. And so the reason he would bring them to Babylon is because he had just finished rebuilding the city. So he's showing his power and then he's going to send them out as slaves to haul timber and stone to Nineveh. And then he's going to allow them to go back to their cities. And that's what happens with Manasseh. So he, he returns. And to try to say that this is some other king of Assyria, when there's no other king of Assyria who has Babylon as a temporary capital, and it's going to be, you know, way later in his reign. There's just no no support for it. And and this obviously makes the best sense. I mean, Manasseh would have to been taken captive twice. One of the things that I've noticed in this document is that whatever the situation, Manasseh is subservient to this other king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Esther Hayden. And so even if it's not describing what's in Second Chronicles 33, uh, verse 11, the, the conditions of the prophecy, the 65-year prophecy, is that the land has to be forsaken of both her kings. Hoshea is taken captive in 723. And then we see that Manasseh is taken captive here in 677. So even if he was taken captive some later, some other time, that, that wouldn't discount this captivity. And, and, and the 65 year prophecy doesn't itself say that he has to be carried to Babylon. It just says that the land has to be forsaken of both her kings. It definitely is forsaken of Manasseh in 677 because he's in the kingdom of Assyria. First going to the city of Babylon. But even if you didn't believe he went to Babylon, he still is not in the land of Israel. Right? So, so it, it's a very bad argument against 677 beginning the 2520 for, for Judah and, and also completing the 65 year prophecy. So anyway, that's, that's one of the things that I had to address. And now, now, we talked last time just a little bit about the symbol of the 2,604 years. And we know that that's going to come into play later, uh, dealing with uh, the symbol of 264, right? And uh, so I'm going to try to do these things in order. But we, we can start to see that symbols are being uh, built up as we continue, uh, as, as I continue to study these these periods of time. 46 years, of course, is a symbol. 19 years is a symbol. It's a metonic cycle. And from 743 or 742 BC to 723. So we got, um, let me see here. I'm trying to remember. So we got 742, 7677. Yeah. So what I wanted to look at was up from, so another date that we had was 977. So 977 BC is going to be the fall of Israel. So when I'm working out the chronology of the kings of Judah, I'm going to notice that there is 235 years from 977 to 742. And that 235 years, in 19 years, there's 235 months. And so that's a metonic cycle. So... I start to, to notice some of these numbers and notice that they have symbols attached to them. 
but I haven't really at this time fully understood all of the symbols, right? Just beginning to understand that. Now, uh, one of the symbols, of course, that we are familiar with dealing with the seven times are periods of 70 years. So the four seven times, this is something that, so we have the prophetic mirror. But as we begin to look at this in the, in the summer of 2013, uh, so I put some personal stuff in there, but we have a camp meeting at Sylvan Lake, Alberta, Canada. And, and I do a presentation on Leviticus 26 saying that it was fulfilled by literal Israel in the four events that Sister White marks as the pro- progression of the captivity that is the result of God's chastisement as prophesied in Leviticus 26. So Ellen White talks about this uh, progression of this captivity, right? And um, and I wrote a paper at that time, which I presented called Leviticus 26 Proto-Daniel, showing that the book of Daniel was connected linguistically, typographically, uh, and structurally, or typologically, pardon me, that's typology, and structurally to Leviticus 26, which I'm not going to go into this time. Um, so I'd gone from working 75 hours a week to 15. So I had lots of time uh, for writing. So 40 to 50 hours each week that I was um, studying this stuff. Um, during that time, I, I, had, I had written over 100 papers and designed hundreds of lines, charts, and diagrams, or I have written, I guess, since that time is what I should probably say. Because it was a lot of, lot of work, right? So a lot of time spent in it. And it was extremely detailed. Now, I never really thought I was a detailed person until I started doing this chronology. And that is, I would just not rest until uh, everything fit, everything made sense. Any little question, Sometimes they would take a couple of weeks just on one little point. So, so I am actually by nature a generalist, not a detail person. Um, but as I look at the big picture, but this was really, really helpful. Uh, the fact that I have that other aspect to my character. Um, because if I, if I wasn't a big picture person, I wouldn't have seen all of the connections. That is, you know, sometimes you can't see the forest. For the trees, you know, that's somebody who's just focused upon the detail but can't see the forest. And thankfully, God's given me a talent where I can I can see both. I just didn't think I was a detailed person, but I guess I was in this point. So when I started looking at this, it became evident that there were four per- periods being referred to in these four seven times. And, and when I laid these out, I found that the chronology differed from the pioneers in little details. For instance, they saw the captivity of Daniel as occurring in 606 BC. That is the third year of Jehoiakim, in which Daniel was taken captive in Daniel 1.1, most closely aligns with the Julian year 606 BC. That is, it's going to go from the fall of 607 uh, to the fall of 606. So when we talk about the third year of Jehoiakim, it's going, we're normally going to say it's 606 BC. And because the pioneers weren't looking for the exact time in the third year of Jehoiakim in which Daniel was taken captive, they just took 606 BC as the date. But we know that it's going to happen in this case in the fall. Okay. And, and we can find this with some other details as well. But now we have 607. And this is going to follow 70 years from 677, right? So we have 607 for 70. There's a 70 year period of probation. Leviticus 26. And it's added to the 70 years of the captivity itself to be a period of 140 years. Right. Now, we also have um, at the end of the 70 years captivity where Cyrus comes to the throne of Babylon with the death of Darius in the fall of 537. And not in 536, as taught by many of the pioneers. More specifically, the year 538 is on both the 1843 and 1850 charts. And yet it's going to begin in the start of the Hebrew year of 538, which is in the fall of 539. 
So when we look at the 1843 chart, there is a date on the bottom, 1843, right? Uh, that date, 1843 on the bottom is correct, right? Agreed. Yeah, because that is the date uh, for the 1335. And that that year, 1843, that we have on the bottom of the chart, when does it begin? In the spring of 1843. Yes, begins in the spring of 1843, and it ends in the spring of 1844. So just as with 538 B.C., which is going to go fall to fall, that is going to be a civil year, um, 1843 on the bottom of the chart is going to be uh, the religious year, right? The ecclesiastical year. So, so you have the ecclesiastical and the civil year, both represented. Now, remember when they made the 1843 chart in 1842, were they taking 1843 from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844 when they made the chart? No. No. They, they actually were just going January 1st to December 31st. That, that's how they were doing it. it. It's not until December of 1842. So this is some, you know, seven months or so after they had made the chart that William Miller suggests that it actually goes from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844. So he's going to do that in December of 1842. Now, he says that he had this in mind before, but had never brought it up. But as he got to the, the beginning of the year 1843, as it was coming, he said, well, you know, it's not going to actually start on January 1st. We wouldn't expect Christ then. It's not going to be until the spring of 1843 is the earliest we can expect Christ. So that's why he... He introduces this in December of 1842. Okay, so we have the charts made in May, May and June of 1842, and they're thinking that's the Jewish year, or not not the Jewish year, it's our year, 1843. But then they start to refine this. And you see this through the Millerite writings as they start to grapple with uh, refining the date. So, so, so this was a, a criticism that I received later on. Uh, a lot of people were very unhappy with me showing that the night of October 13th, 539 BC, that Babylon falls because the 1843 chart says, and the 1850 chart says 538. Um, and some people were not happy with my explanation. And, and the other thing is there's the document that we use, um, that is, uh, 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 it's, uh, part of the Babylonian cro chronicles. It's called, um, um, What's the guy's name? Uh, Nabonidus. Um, I always get the guy's names mixed up. I don't think it's Nabonidus. And, anyway, it's the, the guy who's actually king. Um, it's, it's his chronicle. And A.T. Jones refers to it. And when he refers to it, he has the fall of Babylon being in, uh, in the, in, not in the seventh month, but in the fourth month, the month Tammuz, and and people go to A.T. Jones and say, well, see, A.T. Jones is using this document that says that Babylon fell in the fourth month. Um, but it was because he had the document just after it was found. He had a translation of it, and that translation was incorrect. Somebody had, uh, uh, the guy who had transcribed it, because they didn't have cameras then or photocopies or anything, he actually went to uh, the British Museum and he transcribed the Assyrian by hand and then other people translated it and they misread the seventh month as being actually the fourth month. And, and, it, and it wasn't really, the, didn't say seventh and fourth, it says Tishri, but somehow they read Tishri as Tammuz. And uh, um, so that mistake led A.T. Jones to believe that it was in the month Tammuz that they're having this feast in in uh, Daniel chapter five, but it, but it's not it's not in the month Tammuz, and they have this idea that it has something to do with the festival of wine and stuff. It has nothing to do with that. It's actually if you read the document, um, I think it's Nabonidus, Nabonidus Chronicle. Um, 
it actually describes each month of the year and beginning of, in the beginning of the month or the beginning of the year, uh, they have the Akitu festival and the Akitu festival yeah, is just like with the Jews. They have a festival in the spring and a festival in the fall that are connected. That is, you know, Passover and the day of atonement. The same thing happens in uh, Babylon. And what they're going to do is they're going to be transporting all of these idols to the city of Babylon. They gather them together for this festival in the seventh month and they begin on in the first month. And so, so they bring all of these idols there. And in the seventh month on the 16th day of the month is when the writing on the wall is going to happen. And so that festival, uh, the Akitu festival in the fall is really where this happens. And it has to do with all of these idols that they're worshiping. It's nothing to do with a wine festival. Of course, they're drinking wine, but it's nothing to do with any kind of, uh, of wine festival. It's just a, a worship of all these different idols that they have brought to the city of Babylon to show that Babylon has lordship over all of these, these gods of these different areas and the god Marduk is the one that's in charge, right? So, so this was, you know, for me, it was very interesting finding this out. So with the four seven times, we have, of course, these periods of times, and I'm going to bring them up here so you can see them. Should have had this set up before. Okay, this is kind of an okay chart. I'm trying to find the best chart here. Okay, so this one's pretty good. Okay, so it's just an old chart I made a long time ago. It's not as nice as the newer ones, but... So we can see we have a period of 70 years from Manasseh's captivity to Jehoiakim's captivity. Well, it's actually Daniel's captivity, the third year of Jehoiakim. And, and it's going to be in the fall. And it has to do with the fact that Jehoiachin is anointed when he's eight and 18. And um, the only way that that could work is if he's anointed in the fall. So I'm not going to go into that study right now. But we have these 70 years, right? And then we have 70 years from Jehoiakim to Cyrus. And Ellen White says that when Cyrus uh, succeeds to the throne, it's the completion of the 70 years from when the first Hebrew captives were carried away to Babylon. So then that would be Daniel, right? So Daniel's carried away in the fall. And those 70 years are complete when Cyrus comes to the throne. And she says it's within about two years of the fall of Babylon. Since Babylon falls in 539, in the fall, um, within about two years means it's not more than two years. It's within that, but it's about. That means it's close to two years. And and this is, yeah, so, yeah, the 16th day of the seventh month on the Babylonian calendar. The handwriting of the wall happened. Um, so I'm just looking at a comment there in the chat. Ellen White died on the 16th day of the seventh month. Yeah. Interesting. Of course, different calendar. <clears throat> okay. Um, so Cyrus comes to the throne. That completes the 70 years. But there's still going to be another half a year before he issues the decree in the spring of 536. Now, these two periods of 70 years in Leviticus 26 that he's going to, uh, they're the ones that say, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will chastise you seven times more. Um, and that word more is the word Yasef, same as Joseph. It means to add or prolong. And so these two periods are added together to make a period of 140 years. Uh, but the next periods of 70 years don't just follow after that. Because uh, Jehoiachin is going to have a period of 140 years attached to his captivity. So when he's taken captive in 597, that's 140 years before Artaxerxes' decree. And then we can see uh, that, um, and that one says, I will yet punish you seven times for your sins. Doesn't have the word more. And the idea of that word yet is while you are being punished under the second seven times, I will punish you yet again with this third seven times. That's the siege of Jehoi, siege of Jerusalem when Jehoiachin is taken captive. That we have the record of in the Babylonian Chronicles. So we know the exact date, the 16th day. Or, um, pardon me. Uh, it's going to be March 12th, 
uh, 597, and it's going to be the, uh, the second day of the 12th month, I think. I'm trying to remember. Is it the third or the second? Yes, yeah, the second day of the 12th month. So March 12th on our calendar, the Julian calendar. And then Zedekiah is taken captive. And that's that one doesn't have a yet or a more that defines it. It's the one that just completes the four seven times. So uh, all of the things that happen under the first three seven times, in a sense, are repeated under the fourth. So it's a three one combination. Right. And the fourth represents all of the other three. So it's like a. If you deal with like the th first, second, and third angel's messages, and in the fourth angel's message, you have a repeat of the first, second, and third angel's messages, right? You can see that they're all there. The same thing happens in the fourth seven times. It's uh, an example of that 3-1 um, combination. And, of course, from Zedekiah's captivity, um, there's going to be seven years until... Darius's decree. So one of the things we can see here is um, that there are decrees connected with the end of these periods. Not the first, there's no decree attached to the, the end of the 70 years for Manasseh, but that one's added to the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. And that's going to end with Cyrus. Now, it ends technically with the decree. So, you know, we would just say that the decree itself yeah, so the second day, 12th March, is the 16th of March in 597. 16th, I said 12th, right? So it's the 16th of March. I knew I was doing something wrong. Okay, thanks. Um, but, you know, the decree is actually going to happen in the spring. But it's still going to be 140 years. Just we don't know exactly when Manasseh was taken captive. It's probably in the summer or something like that. But be that as it may, it's it's 140 years. And it's going to end with the first decree. So the decree is going to be connected with the ending of that period, even though the decree follows six months later. And then Darius also has a decree. And Ellen White says uh, that Darius's decree occurs more than 20 years after Cyrus's decree, but less than 20 years after they return to Jerusalem under Cyrus's decree. So that puts it somewhere in the summer of 516. And so you can see, even though the temple is dedicated in the spring of, and that one's going to be the 12th day of the third month and the, and the third day of the 12th month, third day of the 12th month on the biblical calendar and the 12th day of the third month on the Julian, March 12th. And, and that's going to be basically 70 years and six months till the decree or till the dedication of the temple. But the, to the decree, it's 70 years. And so we can see that the Artaxerxes decree, the third decree, is going to end the period from Jehoiachin's captivity. Darius's decree ends the period for the temple. And Cyrus's decree ends those two periods of 70 years. And so this understanding that we have these three decrees and these four seven times uh, gives us these basically 70 way or seven way marks, right? And it's in a four three grouping. What kind of things do we see in four three groupings? The seals, the seals, trumpets, yeah. four trumpets. generations, third or fourth generations. Well, no, but in, in Revelation, we have like, uh, you know, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, they're grouped in four and three. The seven church, I mean, the seven churches, I think. Yeah, seven churches as well. So, so it's kind of interesting that we have this structure here in the book of Daniel. Now, now Stephen would probably remember this. When we were, um, in 2016, when we were at the School of the Prophets and we were looking at some of these things, one of the things we see here is the 220 years. Right? You see that? And, and 220 years is a symbol. So we, we're all familiar. That's a symbol of restoration. It, it actually comes from 22 years as well. And uh, because we see that with um, a Joseph being sold into slavery and 22 years later, his he meets with his brothers who had sold him into slavery. Right. Brother um, Theodore. Yeah. That three decree, is it 70 years between the first decree to the third decree? No. 
No, it's not. Okay. No. All right. It's not. It's not seventy years. No, the seventy years are are not between the decrees. Seventy years are from periods, and the hundred forty year periods are dealing with the four seven times. The decrees themselves, and for instance, you see, you know, Cyrus's decree is, you know, going to be seventy years after Dan is taken captive. 140 years after Manasseh is taken captive. Darius is going to be 70 years after the temple is destroyed. And Artaxerxes' decree is going to be, um, you know, 140 years after Jehoiachin's captivity. But between, you know, 457 and 516, um, that's whatever it is. Uh, I can't, uh, so you got 43 plus 16, that's going to be, what, 59 years? Something like that. But yeah, it actually that. looks as if the decree occurs in 537 for Cyrus, but it's... Yeah, I know. I know. I realize that. So, yeah, it, it doesn't occur in 537. It occurs, we know, on the 24th day of the first month in 536. Because right? it's going to be in the spring that he makes his decree and he comes to the throne in the fall. But... It's still, just like with the temple, there's actually 70 years plus uh, seven months. And in the 70 years for Daniel, um, because it's going to be from fall to fall and then another six months. So it's going to be 70 years and six months. But that's still 70 years. So, yeah, there, we have to wait six months from Cyrus coming to the throne before he issues his decree. But one of the things we noticed in um, just dealing with these symbols. So we're going to sort of finish this off. It was an interesting observation that if we we look at 220 years and uh, we divide it by 70, <coughs> we're going to get we're going to get this number, which is very close to pi. That is uh, the simplest uh, fraction. The smallest fraction that gives us uh, pi is 22 divided by 7. So that's that's a very close approximation to plot to pi, and and so it was um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, if you remember this, Stephen, we were looking at. Uh, I think you pointed out something about my initials. You know, TT kind of would be pi or something like that. Was that you? Um, yes. Yeah. And then you noticed uh, William Pitt, his last name, he was there. Uh, Pitt is pi and then two T's, so he's got double pi. That was kind of kind of interesting. Um, yes. But one of the things we see here is that there is this structure. And in the story of Joseph, there's going to be 22 years, and there's going to be four periods of seven years. And so we have something very similar that happens in the story of Joseph just as we happen here, the 220-year period and four periods of 70 years. So in, this, in the story of Joseph, you could do the same thing. You could take the 22 years and then divide it by seven for the seven years of plenty or seven years of famine or whatever, you know, and, and you would also get pi. So, so we start to recognize that there are mathematical things that we can do with these periods. Um, we also somehow got um, the Fibonacci number, and I can't remember what we did there. So, uh, but anyway, it was it was it was a, a real revelation to us as we started to examine the, these periods that there was more than just you know adding things together or multiplying things or finding uh, parts of things so that things were divided into a structure. But it also produced it produced mathematical numbers of significance, such as pi. Now, so from a a practical side of this, you know, a practical lesson from this is that you know, first, God is revealing these things to us gradually. There's an unfolding of understanding, and it comes from a study of the prophetic periods, and specifically this studying of the seven times that we start to notice these structures and these structures are going to continue to build our understanding of them. 
you know, as we as we look through these things. And so as the movement is moving through time, studying, and I'm studying this chronology and other people are as well, we start to notice things. And these things are brought to Jeff's attention. And uh, it creates um, uh, more and more symbols. So we're, we're going to look at that as we continue going through this. I'm just trying to do it sort of how I understood these things chronologically. It's not, it's not logically. It is if I was going to present all of these things in, in, in a sort of a presentation, I wouldn't go through how I discovered things, but that's what I'm kind of doing here. And, and the reason I'm doing that is that we can see that, uh, we didn't, you know, set some dates and then go back and try to, to do things with the past. These things were already, they're like building blocks put in place and we just followed where God led. So, and people weren't, you know, sometimes people were objecting to certain things that we were doing, but most of the time people could see that this made sense and especially Jeff. So he was accepting these things as they were presented to him step by step. Any final thoughts or questions before we close with prayer? Did you um, record this, Theodore? Yep, it's recording. Okay. Okay. I have well, to watch. I have to watch this again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study uh, this morning. Thank you for the Sabbath, and we ask for your continued presence throughout this day. We pray for one another, for those that we love and care for, and we are thankful, Lord, that. Um, you have been leading us we ask for wisdom and understanding these things that can be difficult to understand um, we know lord that um, i'm trying to present as simply as i can in the straightforward forward as a manner as i can but it is a lot of information and i just pray for those watching it that you can strengthen their intellect their understanding and that you can come close to each one of us we can know that you love us and care for us in spite of ourselves. Help us, Lord, uh, to receive the blessings that you wish to give us on this Sabbath, and we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.